Welcome, Joystick Justice League, to episode 7 of Roundtable. My name is Mike Frusios. I'm Joe Morin. And this episode, we are breaking down all things stereotypes. So, uh, getting us some... Uh, some interesting territory here, Joe. Possibly some controversial territory, and how we just decide to talk about this, or or maybe rant, depending on where this conversation goes. Um, yep. I, I think really the whole point of this is just kind of address how the video game industry, in my opinion at least, is becoming slowly more divided and conquered, along with some long standing like beliefs about the uh, about gaming that aren't necessarily true. I, I think. Yep. It's really hit a wall, and I think it's time to address some of these things before it gets out of hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is a, it's always been kind of an issue. And um, you know, before we started uh, broadcasting, I mentioned a point that uh, you know, with, with these stereotypes, it's it, it's kind of divided the industry and gamers in general. So the, the, I think uh, the idea of the show is to kind of break some of those down and uh, kind of open people's minds a little bit. Yeah, I mean, maybe even hold a mirror up to the gaming universe so that you could possibly see yourself and reevaluate uh, yourself, especially in, this, in the day and age of the internet and with f fanboyism. Um, yes. Things are getting violent out there, Joe. You know, recently, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with Review Tech USA, he he had he had something that he posted that was a little controversial. And I mean, people got a hold of his personal information and put it out on the internet. They were giving him death mm. threats. I I, wow. I, I mean. It's, it's 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 and I know that's that's that doesn't really have to do with stereotypes. It has to do with free speech. But I'm telling you, man, like people fight over over the dumbest things, and and we don't realize that we're all one community. And I think that's what this this episode is trying to address. So, as always, let's start from the beginning with the history of stereotypes. What did it? F we we've talked about this a bit before, Joe. What did what did it feel like growing up in the '80s and '90s, being a gamer? It felt, uh, you know, th 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 there was a c community of gamers, but I mean, uh, amongst the, the, the larger kind of population or people, th there was this perception that, uh, and this still kind of permeates to this day uh, somewhat, that uh, games were just for kids. Absolutely, that's huge. That is probably the, out of all stereotypes that are related to gaming and the game industry, you, you hit it on the nail there, right there. It's the, the idea that games are kids' toys. So... For me, being say like 10 years old in public school or maybe 15 years old starting starting high school, back then you, you couldn't talk about video games on the schoolyard. You you were outcast as a geek and you'd probably be beat up for it. Well, absolutely. I, uh, particularly, I, I, I remember uh, being beat up and picked on specifically for that reason. Oh, you're a nerd. You like to play games in your house. Why don't you go out and play sports and stuff? You know, that's the thing. Again, because of the whole kids toy mentality so you know the the adults never took it seriously they never wanted to sit and watch us play video games you know and and like if you wanted to get a girlfriend or something like that <laughs> don't even talk <laughs> about that like unless no. if you're not playing sports or mm. or doing something cool that's that's nerdy stuff so so for for the most part we had i had to confine my conversations to you know the basement where my 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 game playing buddies would be over. That's when we could talk. But you know there there weren't communities back then that you could share. There were there wasn't an outlet for people to express themselves publicly and feel comfortable. So I mean really all to all the younger, more millennial aged YouTubers and broadcasters and voices out there, really appreciate what we had to go through your forebears to to get you to to where it is today, where you can talk comfortably about this stuff. Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, it was, it's, it was, you know, and, and things, things are starting to change. You know, I, I think the tables really kind of started to turn on that perception of gaming when, uh, when gaming on uh, PCs started to kind of catch on. I, I think, I, I, to me, I, I think that's when that turning point kind of started, to where it started to become uh, a, bit, a bit more acceptable in, uh, in, in general. You know. I think I think that that was a sort of a turning point because then that, that uh, kind of opened that up to a different group of people, like people who use computers instead of uh, playing on consoles. And you know what it was, Joe, back in the like probably the the '90s, with with the beginning of the PC uh, boom, it really was students, like college age students, who. Yeah were in their dorms or, or whatever, like they had, they had the computers cause say they're in engineering or whatever, they're running AutoCAD, but they also have, they can also run Doom. You know, they yeah. can also run XCOM. And then mm -hmm. 
their friends come over to study and then they show them this cool game and it be, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I've got a computer to run this. But then also, like we said in prior episodes, you've got little brothers and sisters at home too asking yeah. questions about these games and that's how it slowly trickles out. And, and like you said, it was, it was really just the technology and also kind of like the conception that Nintendo was a kid's toy. You know, uh, sports games, are, which we're going to get into in terms of stereotypes in gaming, were basically one of the main things other than strategy games that drove PC gaming in the 90s. You've, you've got games like Lakers vs. Celtics, the original Need for Speed, um, Madden Football especially. You yes. could only play true sports simulations at that point on PC. What was your alternative? Tecmo Bowl on Nintendo or RBI yeah. Baseball. It was like, eh, the 20, you know, people like my brother's age in college were like, eh, that's kitty stuff. I'm, I'm gonna go play my PC now. Yeah. The, the, there was definitely the, 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 that, that perception, especially with uh, the original Nintendo and stuff like that, because remember like how that started you know, before that, the, the, the arcades were really big. And then, th then that came out, and, and, and uh, the NES really kind of picked up the, the, that torch that, that the arcade kind of generation handed off. And, uh, and I, I think that that was kind of where that came from because it was probably mostly kids playing at the arcades. And I think that that, that kind of carried over to the, NES, the original NES a little bit. Yeah, and then of course those kids grew up. So as those kids grew up, society grows up a little more and then things start to become accepted a bit more. But at the same time, Joe, I'd say we're not completely there. I'd say overall in your average workplace or whatever, even then, like video games are still like a taboo subject. It's still kind of like a dorky thing. I, I think it's not quite there. I think you know what it's become with mainstream society? It's become that casual diversion, that piece of technology that we were talking about our last round round table that you show off to your friends, you have a few laughs over, and then you put it aside as something that is a toy. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and that, that's not the, the way we looked at it. You know, who I think kind of put this best was. Uh, Going uh, into indie game the movie here a bit, but Anthony Carboni I think kind of summed it up best for like especially you and I our generation. You know, it was something that we grew up with and it was with us for all, our whole entire lives. It, it wasn't just he worded it as it, it's not just some nerdy pastime that we have. For, for us, it was part of our life. Exactly, it, it was it was an integ integral part of our of our everyday lives. Exactly, and this is this is why. I think there's such a perceived battle, be and we're going to get into this too, between, say, the quote-unquote hardcore gamer and the quote-unquote yeah. filthy casual gamer or the mo mobile gamer that they're not a real gamer and that they don't appreciate us. And I, and I guess t to some degree that's true. I I'd say they're, you know, again, like because we're still in that quasi-perception that, that video games are... are somewhat taboo not completely taboo but it's just it's a diversion for nerds that people can partake in um may, maybe maybe that's leading to that that debate i think uh where the kind of the largest gulf in this kind of debate is is uh is uh th this sort of gap that supposedly kind of exists between uh people who like to play sports games and everything else i i, I think that's where one of those I think that's where the largest kind of debate happens. Yeah, but you know what? When you really look at reality, I mean, it's things aren't that black and white. I mean, there are gray areas, and again, we're going to address that as as we go as we move forward uh, into where we are today in terms of, of of breaking down stereotypes in the gaming industry. It, in terms of really getting to this, I think we need to talk personally here, Joe, about how you and I kind of came out of the closet as gamers, so to speak, <laughs> and, and really tried to break down those walls for, for the future generations to be, make this an acceptable pastime that you could talk about in public. Like the things we went through and, and the, I think the strides we made, I know that you kind of took it to the next level. And this kind of relates back to what we were saying before about video games being perceived as a toy. You showed me a game that you've been playing recently that uh, I would say kind of, you took to the next level in a sense. Tell us a little bit about your, your history here, Joe. Are you talking uh, about uh, the new NASCAR game? I am. NASCAR 14 recently came out for the uh, 7th gen. Uh, the, the reason why I, I kind of have always been into racing games and and uh, what really kind of sparks my interest, uh, for people who know me fairly closely uh, and uh, to, to those who really don't, I, uh, I raced semi-professionally for a good portion of my life. So I uh, 
I, I have a kind of a unique uh, viewpoint on this because when, I, when it comes to racing games, I know what a racing game should feel like. I, I, I know what, it, what a race car should feel like when you're going around the track, and then just the uh, the the feeling and the atmosphere of actually being behind the wheel. And you know, so I have a, I have a particular interest in this because it's 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 something that, uh, that I actually did personally. So. So when I when I run to people that say, well, uh, these kind of games, like especially a NASCAR game, oh, that, that, that's only for uh, like the your, your stereotypical uh, redneck United States person would be into, and then so the, so you're saying it's they they perceive it, it not only that it's just a toy and not to be taken yeah. seriously, but it's also for somebody with say a lower mental capacity. That's who most people would say NASCAR 14. Oh, who plays this kind of a game? And you would argue no. I would argue no, because it's having played this this game uh, for for a little bit now. It, it, it's uh, it really nails the atmosphere, and when it comes down to it, like it all does with any other kind of game, is it fun? It absolutely is. You 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 have, especially if you're a person who who, li who likes uh, who, who who likes a racing game. I mean, it, it, it's just it, it's it's a lot of fun, and it, it needs to be taken seriously as a game because it, it is a game, and it is, it, it's a good one. It, it, it nails that feel of actually being in an NASCAR race. Could it, exciting. I, could it actually, do you think it could feasibly teach somebody some of the basic mechanics of how to, how to actually compete on a real, on well, a real, on a real level? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. You know, even uh, when it comes down to like uh, tuning your car to, to know, to, to get it to handle properly, all those tools are there. It actually, you know, you, you, you there's even a career mode where you start off as a lower level racer and you have to, you know, build up experience by doing the proper kind of thing. You can't just go out there and, and race and drive like an idiot. You have to follow the rules and, and actually learn the mechanics of racing, which is quite complicated. What would you say about the, you played the online in this as well. And again, getting back to mm -hmm. the whole stereotype that it's only dumbass rednecks who, who are into NASCAR. What, what, what were your, what was your experience dealing with some of the people who actually play this game online? It was uh, it, it was interesting. Uh, like this is uh, this particular game is still fairly new, so I mean it, the the community isn't uh, too large, but there's seems to be a there's a definite uh, there's two different types. There's the people that really take it seriously and, and race it the way, the way they should, and then you get your guys that go out there and drive the opposite direction and, and just go out there and intentionally they're 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 racing game trollers essentially, you know. So the, it's it's a divided community now. I think that those kind of trollish kind of racing gamers will be kind of pushed off to the side after they get banned and they get kicked out so many times that they'll kind of give up but it, it has a potential to be a really good solid online racing game yeah and, and, but would you overall say that the actual like the character the personality of the people you come across would, would they would they support the claim that that nascar fans are rednecks or were they counter it is a bit of both like what, how, do, how what is it like what you've experienced so far or even just in real life i mean like tell us about what maybe break that down if you think that's the wrong perception like what prove us wrong i, I, I think that that'll that the perception especially nascar you know that it'll always be kind of perceived as, as the uh as a, as a redneck kind of a thing to be into and what I say to people like that is have you ever been behind the wheel of a race car do you actually know what it's like and if the answer is no you can't really talk shit about it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very true man it's very true and, and, but that's the thing you know it's like right there you know you've made a real life activity that you, you've excelled at work in tandem with, with a video game activity and, and, and I would say you're learning from both you're already breaking down this stereotype that, that gamers don't leave their house you know no. you have a job just like I have a job you leave your house every day you have social relationships you find time mm -hmm. for gaming but you also like me to an extent me, me as well that we, we both try to make gaming work functionally within our lives and that, and again, that goes back to what you were saying before about gaming being part of you about being uh, being part of your identity it's like when you when you finally realize when you wake up and you, and you accept yourself as a gamer that this is something i i truly have a passion for but i have mm. to i have to break down the stereotype that, that people see me as lazy that they see me as unmotivated that they see me as wasting my time whereas i use my gaming to broadcast to to communicate yes. with people whether it's for entertainment or expressing political ideas or or just having fun you know we're making a news show based on our gaming so it, it's about making it work and that's what you've kind of done 
with the whole carding relationship. There's also the, the side, there's another side to that we always have to fight as well. I, and it kind of plays into like gender stereotypes too. And this is what I've kind of fought with in terms of my preferences for video games. And as a lot of people know that I play all types of games, but really my weakness is platformers, okay? I love to speed run a good hard ass platformer. And unfortunately, well, for, for me over the years, some of the hardest platforms also happen to be some of the cutest, okay? Yes. Rayman Legends, Mario, you know, Super Meat Boy, you know, games that, when you're when you're hardcore Call of Duty and Madden playing buddies that you've met on PSN or Xbox Live Arcade, they see you playing Rayman, and this was back when Rayman just came out. Like it, now, yeah. it's pretty accepted that it's a great game, people know about it. But back when Rayman Origins came out, trying to explain that you can't play Call of Duty today because you're you're burning through a Rayman level, it's like, what are you gay? Like, what are you little kid? Like, I'm like, and then I'd be like, do you understand how hard this game is? No, because you haven't played it, because you're giving into this stereotype that because it looks like it was designed for children, that it's only meant to be played by children. And, and Joe, I'd say Minecraft is a, is probably one of the greatest modern battlefields for this this whole debate right here. And, uh, you know, uh, Minecraft in particular, I mean, uh, yes, there are uh, a large number of younger people that play it, but this is a game that, that, that uh, crosses all genders and age groups. I mean... There are all different kinds of people playing this game. This is one that, that, that is actually helping to, to break down that stereotype of, of just kids playing uh, games. I mean, the, the, there's a, one particular podcast that, that, that I like to watch on uh, Lee Laporte's network, Twit, uh, about Minecraft. And you see people there of all different races and backgrounds and genders playing this. I mean, it, it's, it's a, that game in particular really stands out. Uh, for me it, it's like, like I, I just wish i'd done that like a little more research i wish i could pull up right now just out of thin air an infographic of who actually buys lego because really minecraft yeah. is the virtual version of lego and i'll be damned mm -hmm. if i don't see adults buying you know you know death custom death star lego play sets just as much as the kids <laughs> do you know it's about the power of imagination hey, there's nothing wrong with it looking cute again it's just this whole stereotype mm -hmm. that cute has to be necessarily, you know, infantile, and, and, and that's the thing. And I and I and, that, and I'm glad that word of mouth works. You know, that that games like Rayman Legends got its due, and especially seeing all the people now that are buying Wii U's, it's 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 striking, man. People yeah. that you would never think, like people in their thirties, people in their twenties, people who've come from hardcore gaming backgrounds, are getting all excited to play Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze now because they want a challenge. They want. I think part of it, Joe, is that. It's kind of like, no matter how old you are, if you wake up early on a Saturday morning with a bowl of cereal and turn on cartoons, you forget you're 30. It's kind of, I think that's the same feeling we get when we play Mario. It's just it kind of, uh, it's, I think that's healthy. Now, the, with the cartoons, I mean, uh, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I still like to watch like a uh, old Bugs Bunny and Tweety show and Ren and Stimpy and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it, it, it's stuff that we grew up in and a lot of it still stands up. And uh, it, it's just fun. fun fun to watch and we can feel nostalgic about it and there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with that well i think it's just the, and that's the thing i think it's just again because of of the, the i'd say the attack on masculinity today like the war on masculinity mm -hmm. today where where all of these neocons and people who just don't give a shit about humanity are trying to dictate what what a man is supposed to be like and, and accordingly young men are confused i mean i see it all over the place you know but young men don't know how to express themselves because they're they're afraid they'll appear sexist or racist or whatever ist or whatever and that's why it's it's like like when i get when a cute hardcore game like say donkey kong Tri Kong, Kong Country Tropical Freeze comes out, a lot of older, you know, stereotypical ma man's men are gonna ignore that shit. They're gonna be like, oh, that's not Madden. That's not Call of Duty. That's not Battlefield. That looks gay. You're gay for playing that. And, you know, I think you're missing out. You, you just gotta let yourself go. I mean, look, at, look, at, look, look at the brony movement, Joe. Have you heard about this? No, I haven't. The, the the whole new little my little pony ever since it was rebooted now there's all these these men that profess like we're talking about like 34 year old men who who go to conferences together and and they, they make <laughs> fan art and they dress up as their favorite little ponies there's actually a documentary about this but again I, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing Joe but you gotta do, in this in this crazy fucked up world if it makes yeah. you happy it makes you happy yep yeah. it's all it's all in the eye of the beholder man it's uh 
You know, when it comes to all these different kind of genres of games, you know, you, you just you, you can't have like a just like for example, let's say Call of Duty people, you can't you can't just have them saying oh because they don't personally play sports games, they can't go to somebody and say oh well, you play sports games, so you shouldn't be playing that because I don't like them. You, you you can't make generalizing statements like that because that person for sports games, I mean like like, like I already said earlier, it, it, it's still a game, but it's a different type of game. Oh yeah, dude. No. I mean, you've you've hit on probably the most demonized genre in video gaming today, and it wasn't always like this, Joe. Growing up, sports games were considered like the cream of the crop for PC gaming. Sure. Like we said, I mean, in the '80s and '90s, they were considered serious games that everybody played. No matter whether you're a computer geek or a jock, you played Madden football on the PC back in '91. Absolutely. You know, it's or 1990. Sorry, and um, I. I think it was because of the EA syndrome, Joe. I think it, I think it wrote its own tombstone in the sense of coming out with useless fucking sequels every year and watering down these titles. You know, um, in the NES days, there were two Tecmo Bowls, okay, and they were both phenomenal and very mm -hmm. hyped. But then you fast forward to the next gen, there's a Madden every year, and then they start yeah. looking the same. And we're still in that today. And that and that's it. when you look at the um, the used game market. Those yes. are the first bargain bin games you will see. Are all the sports sequels minus maybe some of the classics, but and that, and that brings up uh, one of the things too. And I think why some of these other kind of gamers like to shoot down uh, sports games because, uh, admittedly, so I mean, uh, like uh, each year, like it just it's, it seems like incremental kind of improvements or changes. So I I, I, I can kind of see what, uh, why they like to kind of nitpick and poke fun at it. But but still, it's still an unfair stereotype. I mean, let's admit it. Oh, absolutely. You know? I encounter I, I I encountered it all the time when I went game hunting across the U.S. You know, like you know, if if you're even like picking up a copy of an old Madden on Genesis, they're like, oh, you're not taking yourself, you're not taking this seriously. It's like, well, Madden '93 was actually a benchmark game. You know, so everybody knows that. You know, it's like, but that's the thing. You know, the the people, the thing people forget is that EA would not be EA without FIFA and Madden. And, and I would say, mm, so. like other than maybe racing games, mm -hmm. sports games are the earliest indicator of what a console hardware, PC hardware is capable of doing. We always look to it as our benchmark. I'd say that became the, 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 real, like the real phenomenon back when the PS2 was released and 2001 Hockey was the demo game to show off how powerful the system was. I was just gonna get, gonna mention that we, we mentioned that on uh, earlier on one of our previous shows when uh, at the time I was living in, in New Brunswick, and uh, they had the uh, they had that that uh, display unit of the PS2 and the game that they they had two games running on it they had NHL and Madden, and I'll tell you every time I went there there were people standing around there playing that game and it was on there to, to sh like, like we're saying to to showcase you know the sports games are a good benchmark to show what these systems are capable of. Yep. But but at the same time I, I get it like you know what happened it's like me with the Assassin's Creed franchise at first I I, I kind of liked it you know it was, it was a cool idea and then you see one every year and you realize that if they had just taken that extra year of development they could have blown out of the water I traded in Black Flag like 15 minutes after playing it I was like this is the most boring contrived repetitive like. I'm sure it has its fans. Like, great, I know a great, a great Metacritic score, but this is what happens when you dilute a great idea by just throwing it out with little incremental changes every year, rather than do the proper franchise of releasing a game sequel, like maybe every few years or so, like Uncharted does. I know that's exactly. a different genre, but you know what I'm, you know what I'm getting at here. Exactly. You know, and it's. I think it maybe has to do with these developers. Like they, they seem to get kind of pressured to. To release something every year, and you know, these, to make a really good game, I mean, it takes time, and that's why we see some of these uh, kind of larger games, like uh, for example, you know, like a GTA 4 and like Red Dead. You know, they it, it's they, they took like three, some of these in three, four, five Ten years, years to, sometimes to, to, to make. You know, and, and, and these really good games, they, they they take time to make, and when a game gets rushed up like that, that's what. Uh, it, you end up with, with games that have flaws in them or like with sports games you you only see my, uh, kind of little minor improvements because they don't have time to, to, to make a whole number of changes they only have a year right? like I'd say realistically just just go on a two year development cycle just stretch it out mm -hmm. and see what happens 
I think people can wait. I think yeah. by the t like by by the time a year is up and like say somebody who's bought Madden, we'll still find another reason to get another year out of Madden if you throw some enticing DLC, maybe some some patches to update the graphics a bit until the next yeah. game comes out. I think mm -hmm. I think that would benefit EA and the whole in, the whole genre in the long run. And also competition, Joe. But you know that's another yeah. topic for for another day. But so, so that's sports games. Let's talk about some other current um, genres of gaming or or gamers. Let's talk about Call of Duty, Joe. What's the big stereotype there? Is that Call of Duty players only play that and that's it? They, they're called meatheads. By Before the hipsters. Yep. So what? What d d describe the, the 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 typical Call of Duty meathead as we've come to understand them? Well, you know, they, they could be kind of best described as you know uh, ones that uh, you know that that gets all they play. They've maxed it, leveled out, and, and particularly in that kind of game, you know, we have the, the term camper. And what, what, those kind of, what, those, what those gamers do is they, they, they find somewhere up nice and high to hide, and they just pick people off, right? And th th that's one of, probably one of the one of the biggest kind of stereotypes that come out of Call of Duty is are those players that, that they, they just they, they play it so much that they know where to hide and it will never be touched. And here's the problem: like it's questionable whether this is this is even a stereotype when Infinity Ward themselves came out and said that we estimate that the majority of our of our demographic are not actual gamers by definition which actually started this whole controversy over what is a gamer what what defines a gamer what do you think joe are, are call of duty players gamers are they not absolutely they are you play call of duty i've played some you know i i i, I like first person shooters but you know this is actually going back to something I, I said before. You know, one of the, the big things that turned me off of online player was uh, of, of playing online games was was online Call of Duty. I, I just it, it's a it's the kind of game where you need to kind of get into it early so that you can keep up. You know, it, it's not the kind of uh, game where uh, somebody just picks it up, starts playing, and is immediately going to have kind of fun playing it. You, you know, you have to be prepared to. to to get your ass handed to you several times and, and, and just kind of ride the bottom until you kind of slowly kind of build yourself up, you know. You absolutely and hit, turns, yeah. And I think it turns a lot of people off. Yeah, because it's again the, the whole patience thing of, of investing your time. You got it right, Joe. I mean, you spend some time with Call of Duty, you will get better. Even me, like I always absolutely. go on and on and on about how I suck at it. Yeah, I, maybe I suck for the first hour and then I get comfortable. The other thing too is that it's you know, you hit a point that it's it's easy to get turned off by the stereotype of the COD meathead. People yeah. who are new to COD, Call of Duty, think that that's all there is because of the stereotype. And, and mm. this is the other problem with online communities is that in reality, I've played a lot of Call of Duty, Joe, and, and those yep. people are kind of a minority, but they're loud and they're frequently yes. loud. And they're the... Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. The real Call of Duty players that, in my opinion, the ones who also play other games, who appreciate the game for what it is, but also appreciate the medium outside of one particular game, are usually pretty quiet and just want to play a nice game with everybody else. And, and that's why I think people and gamers in general, you've got to understand that whether it's an MOBA or whether it's a shooter or MMO, there is a there is like a probation time you have to go through. That you're gonna suck, that you're gonna get your yeah. ass handed to you, but you gotta get through it, and then you will become better. League of Legends is, is like a number one example of that. And that's one thing that, that still makes Call of Duty a, a game. I mean, all of these kind of games. You know, another good example is uh, Super Meat Boy. I always, for some reason, tend to bring up this game, but uh, on that same kind of level, but in a different way. I mean, you're not playing against other people, but I mean, another one where. Starting off, I mean, uh, that first uh, chapter is, is fairly easy because it's teaching you. But after that, I mean, you die several several times, but then you get better. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, so, so with Call of Duty, it's the same thing, but it would just it, just in a bit of a different way. It, 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 it's, it's still a game that you have to get used to playing. It just uh, it may take you a little bit longer, but it's still on that same kind of uh, wavelength. Yeah, why are, we, why are we talking about this? Because, again, it goes back to the stereotype of the meathead making Call of Duty unenjoyable. And I, I hear a lot of people yeah. 
complaining about this, and I have included it myself. But at the same time, we always have to remember this is this is not everybody who plays this. We got to remember it too. We're, why Call of Duty became big. Like, it, it, people are so easy to shit on it. Like, it, oh, you're not cool if you even mention Call of Duty, another stereotype mm -hmm. of the hipster versus whatever, the meathead. Modern Warfare 2 and 1 were important games, okay, in the history of video gaming. It, it, it's unfortunate that corporate interests hijacked that franchise and diluted it, but let's give credit where credit's due. I mean, we, we really have to stop just like we stop viewing sports games in this, in this, we can't talk about it in in video game company. We can't talk about sports games on podcasts where we won't look like real hardcore gamers. That no, 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 it's it's all part of one ecosystem, Joe. Yeah, and, and keep in mind that the Call of Duty games, uh, the large majority of them, some of the best Sonic games of all time, and, and that, that, that kind of says it there. It, it game that obviously has an audience and people. I mean, I personally. Uh, lined up for Modern Warfare 2, that lineup was huge. Exactly. It, 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 it was a good game, so you can't necessarily shoot, shoot Call of Duty down just because you're not good at it. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or just uh, be afraid to actually put some time into like you have to do with any, any other game just because you so, might run into a few trollers. I mean, really, sticks and stones. But it, it's funny, like, we, we were kind of touching on, on the people who always kind of call out the Call of Duty meatheads what I term as the retro hipsters, another mm -hmm. gaming stereotype. So, Joe, what is a retro hipster? You know, a retro hipster, or, yeah, I guess if you want, we want to call them that. You know, these are game uh, gamers that uh, that are still in love and still mainly just play the uh, retro games like uh, NES, Genesis, and so on and so forth. But they also are known to hate on whatever's new or whatever's popular. Just like exactly. in indie rock, like I went through the whole indie rock thing, you know, I worked at a radio station and, you know, you, you mentioned the wrong band and you're like socially ostracized and, and, and that's what I'm afraid it's be, it's come to. Like dialogue shuts down because we, we've created these factions like in like which, which is why I like part of the reasons why like I hate music sometimes because of the factions that we can't just talk about different genres because somebody might hate country or somebody might hate dance music and yeah. they don't even understand why they hate it and that's what's coming down with video games and I think that's something maybe that's inevitable in society Joe I don't know if that's something we can stop but at least like we're saying with this podcast we can hold a mirror up and, and show mm -hmm. you that you don't need to be like one of these stereotypes you can be you can be any of these at any one time. I think, you know, in in, uh, in in retro games, I mean, uh, you know, the, the this hatred of, of the, the retro hipster again is unfair because, looking now, a lot of uh, really cool games coming out, especially indie games, they're, they're retro style games, and you know, they, they were they they were always popular and they are still popular. Made by some. Equally, I hate to say it, kind of hipsterish creators. I mean, like you know, sure. uh, the Meat Boy devs that made no mistake of Tommy made no mistake of saying that he hates Call of Duty. He hates all these modern shooters and stuff. And wanted to make something old. You know, uh, God love Phil Fish, but you remember how he was called out for being a fucking hipster, whether that's true or not. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that myself. I'm just saying that that attitude is very live. It's it's. I think it's again a re it's a natural reaction though, Joe. It's it's easy yep. to call somebody a hipster and say that they're a snob, when really yep. they're just reacting to what's going on in the industry. And I agree, it's a glut of useless shit, just mm -hmm. like sequels and remakes and reboots, you know. And I try to be mm -hmm. impartial because I want to know the best of both worlds. But at the same time, I can feel. I, I think that. The, the retro hipsters hatred of, of the current gen is misplaced because it's ironic in the sense that I'd say the current gen more than any is promoting the very thing that they love, the indie games, the yep. retro art. It, it is very ironic now that I think about it. That, and that's what I was trying to tell all these people who were hating on PS4. I'm like, like mm -hmm. that, I, that I know are into indie games and like retro art. I'm like, do you realize all the stuff that you're gonna love that's not AAA that's coming to PS4 and then Xbox exactly. One and Steam? Like, and, and that's the thing again. You know, it's, it's 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 just like stop hating, stop viewing everybody as the other. We are all in this together. It's just like it's just like in music. You may like country, I may like jazz, but it doesn't mean we can't just talk about things and, and teach each other. You know that exactly. it's like any medium. Like if if you have an open mind, you're gonna 
you may not necessarily like what that other person likes, but you may like something of it, and something that may expand your horizons in, in some case. I, that's my real challenge to the retro hipsters that I, that, I, that are the really hardcore ones that say, oh, fuck next gen and stuff. Understand that this all works in cycles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, and I, I think another good uh, stereotype uh, to touch on here is uh, the uh, the mobile gamer. I'm oh talking, man, uh, I'm, I'm talking mainly on uh, on phones and tablets. The filthy casual, as as we've we've been called, actually. So exactly. what what is it? So this is actually a fairly new stereotype in the game industry. The idea mm -hmm. that the mobile gamer isn't a real gamer; they don't appreciate the medium. What do you what do you think about that charge? I would have to particularly disagree because uh, I, I do a fair amount of it, and that's quite so much recently. But I mean, uh, yes, there are a lot of casual games on mobile devices. There, there's no denying that Candy Crush and so forth. But uh, there are a lot of good, unique titles like a uh, Device Six or the games that we've covered before that uh, that people are putting this down or are, are, are actually missing out on some really cool experiences. You know, the, the, these devices now. Uh, you know, phones aren't uh, what they used to be. The phone. Uh, I did some research. I think I mentioned this to you before. The the new iPhone is as powerful as every computer in the world combined in 1969. You know, the, the, these the, these these small portable devices are are, qu are quite capable and are, are capable of actually some really cool game experiences that people are missing out by hating on it. I absolutely agree, Joe. And the thing is, is to now, like, seeing what happened in the last couple of years with with companies like Fire Axis starting to bring like XCOM over to like mm -hmm. iPad, and and you've yep. got all these cool strategy games now. There, you know, the the idea that a mobile gamer is a filthy casual is just it's just kind of it boggles my mind that that even is an argument anymore. We're not we're not in what what was it like 2007, 2008 when Angry Birds came out or whatever. Like it's it's it seems like a long time ago, but. It's not. I mean, like it evolved really fast, and and, uh, the, and it's not going away anytime soon. And the, these devices are, are quite capable. I, I even saw something on uh, on YouTube today that uh, somebody actually got uh, had Super Meat Boy running on a, on a Samsung tablet by hacking it or putting some kind of mod on it, and, and it, it ran just fine. Now these, these uh, devices are only capable of, of running the the games that that come with them that you can buy natively for it. But people are, are finding ways to actually play some of these console kind of games on here. So, you know, it's there's quite a bit you, quite a bit you can do with these mobile devices. I absolutely agree. And, and you know what, to, to one extent, I, I think I understand where some of the the outcry from the so-called hard gamers is coming from. It, it's going back to what I touched upon earlier in this podcast. It's, it's, the, uh, it's that resentment towards the casual gamer who, who doesn't respect the industry. And, and to some degree, mm -hmm. I can support that. You know, the whole Candy sure. Crush phenomenon. I know mm -hmm. people who, who you're Candy Crushing all the time, but you, they'll ever, will they ever admit that they actually like video games and play company? Hell no. And that's kind of a slap in the face again to what we went through to make this like a viable culture, what we're trying to be mm -hmm. part of here. I, I, I ran into that in particular with Candy Crush. I mean, I remember one in particular, I saw a woman playing on her phone, and I, and I just out of curiosity said, Well, what are you doing? I, I said, I'm uh, well, she said, well, I'm playing Candy Crush. I go, so well, like, do you play any other kind of games? And she said, oh, no, no, I, I don't play, I don't play video games. And I thought, well, you know what? What are you doing right now? I'm playing Candy Crush. Like that, that's that's still a game in my, in my opinion, kind of a shitty game. And that's just my personal opinion, but I mean, but it's still a game. You know, and, and why some some people are, are afraid just because they play these kind of casual games? I don't, I don't understand the stigma, like that people are afraid to, to consider themselves gamers. Like, I, I don't because again, understand. that people will think that they're lazy, that they don't try hard enough, that they they waste their free time. Yeah. Joe, we're we're a bunch of lazy it's, people. It's right? We waste our time, right? You know, <laughs> like I don't see what we're doing different from somebody who's in a movie theater all day, but they're considered a, a cinephile. We're considered nerds, right? You know, so. Yeah. But the other thing, it goes further than that, Joe. It's like, okay, let's, okay, so then uh, Candy Crush is a big scapegoat. Um, but at the at the heart of it, I kind of like Candy Crush. I like match three games, but yep. I don't want to feel guilty for playing it because then, oh, I'm like that Candy Crush girl who hates on video games. Yeah. It, it reminds me of that song lyric from uh, from Coax Me by Sloan. It's not, uh, mm -hmm. it's not the band I hate, it's their fans. Mm -hmm. And I think people in general, all you fanboys out there who get butthurt, 
or people hating on games that you like or systems, you just gotta remember that people will always hate. They're all they're always gonna be tourists who yeah. who don't belong to this industry, who think it's cool or hip for a second, kind of like all those people who bought Wii's back in 2006 and let them yeah. collect dust. You know, there, there's always gonna be tourists. You know, talk to any Cuban what they think of of, of the rest of us. You know, <laughs> yeah. exactly. That's just something and that's that, not gonna go away. And that actually kind of leads into another one I want to talk. I want to talk about it or that uh, this uh, supposed stereotype that uh, that gamers or that sorry that uh, that girls can't be gamers and that they're not good at games. Okay, this is big, actually, um, very big, because. You, you you hang out enough on on either the PSN or Xbox Live, one of these major popular platforms, mm-hmm. you'll find out differently quite quickly. What what yes. have you learned about video gaming and girls? Like okay, what, what's the stereotype about video gaming and girls? Let's let's put it on the table. What what do most people think about that? Most of them think that they kind of mainly play shooters, and that they're not really kind of that they're not really good at games, or that girls don't really. That they're not good at playing games, but they only like certain types of games, like a kind of cutie, emotional kind of games, and it's very unfair. I mean, I know some uh, some uh, female gamers, and and one in particular, my one of, one of my cousins that we, we you and I actually spoke to uh, not too long ago can be, or some of them are actually very accomplished. I mean, she was uh, one of the, uh, the top ranked uh, Mario Kart players on Wii, you know. That they, 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 they can game it just as good as the guys can. I'm telling you right now. It's it's well known if you read the stats that that females make up fifty about fifty percent, maybe fifty one percent of the video game industry. Um, mm-hmm. And, and that, that's the other thing too. That there's a stereotype too. Even with the people who are sort of awake and know that video game women can play video games okay, there's still the stereotype that they only want to play um, Mass Effect or they only want to yeah. play emotional, story driven games. You you go sure. you you go on a Tom Clancy Ghost Recon. You get your ass handed to you by yeah. by a, a 19 year old prostitute from the Philippines who's on <laughs> there look scoping for customers. These girls will kick your. I'm I'm serious. This is what happened. Okay, okay? Yeah. I met so many girls that were hot by all standards. Probably prostitutes because I know what they did. They were really on there for, but they were kicking ass. Girls are some of the best Call of Duty players out there. Yep. I don't know what it is. Yeah. This whole lie that females don't have better as like the perception that men do in terms of depth perception it's a fucking lie it they is. will kick your ass and girl gamers yeah. are out there and they like more stuff than just you know mass effect and pokemon yeah it's uh, very very true <laughs> and, and that's the thing so we're hoping to get more girl gamers on these these round tables too i i, I think this is more of like a topic i really want to address in a future podcast because it's really like where we kind of get the yep. gender um just kind of going back though, in a second though, talk about the hardcore gamer. What? Let, let's let's really, like let's let's get into that discussion for a sec. We we kind of what is a gamer, Joe? Like what is a hardcore gamer? If, if if there is a hardcore gamer, such a thing, what is it? Or at least what what do we think it is? Or what should it be? Let's start with what we think it is. What's the stereotype? Uh, that's a hard kind of a, a thing to, to kind of describe because I mean every kind of a game genre can have its you know. Really, I, th- I, th- I think really a hardcore gamer. Okay, wait, wait. Let me really... stop you there. Let me stop you there. How do movies typic and TV typically portray gamers, Joe? From what you've seen in mainstream movies and TV, like right off the top of your head, how are they usually portrayed? Mainly as as the first person shooter kind of player, player game. Like I, I think that that's one of the first ones that comes up. That and then in the online uh, role playing games. Yeah, like kind of like the the overweight, you know, antisocial. Yeah nerd who doesn't leave their house or no. or yeah like the spaz the the whole the total alpha male who who plays shooters and stuff like that and that's i think that's typically it so it, it seems like there's like this pantheon of games that you need to to play or know about to be considered uh, a hardcore gamer per se again we're, we're trying to break down the stereotype what are some of those games that you think of that that oh you're a hardcore gamer if you play this the first one i can think of is, is definitely world of warcraft What's some other ones? Some other ones, obviously, Call of Duty would be another one. You uh, think so? Still? You think so? I, 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 I think I think that that still falls under that category. I think even uh, you know uh, like 
I mean, uh, there, there's so many games I mean that could be considered there. I think you have Metal Gear, uh, Final Fantasy, but you know what I think what what to the proper way to describe a hardcore gamer is just a, a gamer who plays a game but is like a real kind of a, a completionist and likes to do everything that they can in a game. I think that that's. The, the, the way that it should be perceived as. As a, as, a, as a gamer that just gets everything out of a game and does everything that they can with it. Yeah. And I would I would say that, to me, what defines a gamer is, going back to what I say time and time again, a respect for the medium and, and a passion in it yes. that goes beyond just, you know, playing it like once a month with your buddies when you're having a couple of beers, but being in, invested in, in the news, talking about it outside of your playing experience as conversation. And like I said, a respect for it, you know, and, and not only respect for what you play, but respect for what other people play. And, and, and that's the thing, you know, all these fanboys who go either side, they, they act like they're the best, the real gamers because they know everything about Sony or they know everything about Xbox. No, you've already put up these walls. You've already closed your mind off to all these other possibilities. So somebody who plays only PlayStation will never play Alan Wake, will never play Halo. Will, for now, will not play Titanfall. So you're, you're the ones who are missing out or, or, the, or the PlayStation haters who, who refuse to play Uncharted. Well, you're the loser here. Like you're not, you're not a gamer. Like gamers play games. They don't play consoles, Joe. That's right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's what I come. That's, you know, I, th I think you really kind of, you know, you re really nailed that by saying, uh, you know, what a hardcore gamer is, is is somebody that that just embraces everything about gaming and just in every every aspect. Yeah, I mean, are stereotypes ever going to go away? No. Can we work around mm -hmm. them? I think so. I think if, if we understand, again, if we if we if we can talk about each other without screaming at each other and about, without closing our minds and not listening to what other people have to say about games, what other people like, we will continue to to divide ourselves off and, and put ourselves in these little closed-minded cliques. And and the people who do that really are the losers in the end, who, who don't get that wide experience versus people like me, who I, I keep an open mind to everything that comes out. I'll play an RTS, I'll play a pinball game, then I'll go play a platformer, then I'll go play an RPG. It, it's whatever the mood strikes me and that's really the way it should be. I mean. I mean, just really addressing why why people go why people why do people even want to define themselves? Because I know people who do want to be these stereotypes, who are proud to say that I'm a retro hipster and I hate everything else. Why is that, Joe? Why do people want to do that? You know, it, that, that's a bit of a, of a, of a mystery to, uh, to me. You know, it's uh, you know because like you said, you know, it, when, they, when they do that, they shut themselves off from experiencing all these other kind of games, and, and it's you know. Uh, why would they, they want to do that? Like why, like, why, like, why would somebody want to shut themselves off and identify with a group? The, uh, the, maybe it's just it's fear uh, of uh, of getting into something else. I mean, uh, it's it's hard to explain, man. It really is. You know, why, why somebody would shut themselves off that much? I think it's just from the insecure, the general sense of insecurity that of society today, Joe. Yeah. I think it's 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 through like marketing and media, how especially with women, the way women are supposed to be taught to feel through advertising, through their perception, the way blacks and Hispanics are represented, the way they're supposed to feel about themselves, the way white people are supposed to feel about themselves. We're all insecure. We're all looking for an, an other to blame, to, to, to contrast ourselves to, to make ourselves feel stronger with this like this fake sense of identity. So it's like, oh well, if I if I stop playing PS4 and I go buy a Nintendo and an old tube TV and and some Chuck Taylor and start eating vegan food, then I'll I'll belong. And uh, I don't know. It's just it's uh, like keeping an open just, mind. You know, uh, that's so easily influenced by what they see in mass media and stuff like that. I think it has to do with it a little bit too. That, that if they get into a particular thing, that they'll be out, they'll be outcast and you know. Stop uh, hating so much, people. At the end of yeah. the day, stop like kissing these multinational corporations' asses. Like, stop like saying, "Oh, I'm a Sony fanboy. I'm an Xbox fanboy." These companies don't care about you. At the end of the day, okay, they're they're just out yeah. to make money. Fight over something that's real, and stop fighting to begin with. I mean, what's the point? I mean, we have this wealth, this growing medium at our hands that's just getting more evolved with every generation. Why why do we need to fight over? Why can't we just all embrace it? I don't know. It's, it's going to take time. We'll we'll see how that goes. But uh, all I can say, people, is that 
when, when you start to hate on a particular group and start to categorize them as all being the same, then you are basically ironically become the same thing yourself. You're, you're like a, a counter stereotype stereotype. You, be, you almost become your own stereotype by doing that kind of thing. You know, it, it, it's it, it's harmful to the uh, to the, the gaming industry in particular with the with the game makers and game players. You know, the, the, these kind of stereotypes and divisions. I mean, it just it, it, it hurts everybody. Whereas it, it, it should uh, be more of a unifying kind of a thing. You know, people are will just will, willing to open their minds a little bit and, and just go beyond a certain type of game that they play. Expand your horizons a little bit. And you you will be rewarded with uh, with with trying new things. Don't yeah. just close yourself off. The key to expanding your horizons, people, is you've got the internet. You've got research at your disposal. Use it. You see some news come out. Click on that link. Look, try try something you have. Like look at something you haven't tried before. Be open minded. You never know where that ride's gonna take you. Um, yep. It's only like, like I said, we we have a very rich industry at our hands here. Might as well take use of it. So. Um, that that's been been pretty interesting stuff. I mean, this debate's not over. There's there's so many other things we probably haven't covered. People, if you have your own opinions, definitely comment, like, share. If we see enough debate, we can always do like a follow up podcast. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to kind of say about this topic before we wrap up this uh, excellent episode of Roundtable? Well, no, all, all, I, all, all I'm going to suggest here is that uh, is that just reiterate uh, to to not to uh, hate on. Uh, People who play certain types of games just because you don't like them, you know. And like we said, we see this in other kind of forms of media, and it it, it just it, it creates unnecessary hatred between these groups. You know, just just uh, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, I always seem to say this. You know, just play play a game for the love of the game. Not don't just be married to a certain type of thing. You know, just just, just play games for for the love of the game, people. Yeah, exactly, and and also. You know, don't be don't be afraid to ad- admit you like something that's been demonized, like say Call of Duty. Okay, yeah, there's the yeah. Call of Duty meathead, but if you if you truly enjoy it, then don't don't feel guilty for playing it. You're you're yeah. that that's just one type of person, like we said, who is very vocal and happens to be out there, but that does not represent the rest of the community, and that goes for any game. So you you know somebody who you don't like who plays a certain game, don't blame the game, play the blame the player. Exactly. Absolutely. All right, guys, so that's uh, it for this roundtable. Uh, stay tuned, as always, to Joystick Justice League uh, for lots more recordings and content and our blogs. Uh, Joe's got his at joemorin.blogspot.ca. I've got yep. mine at alarmbellnetwork.wordpress.com. You can also catch Joe and I uh, streaming pretty much every day live video games and discussion on www.twitch.tv forward slash 20 Verbit Heroes. Uh, it's always a good time. Um, so that's it for this episode of Roundtable for Joystick Justice League. I'm Mike Brusios. I'm Joe Morin. And uh, game on, guys. Peace. Game on, guys. <laughs>